Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. So wild doing this again and just like being a part of Shy Hack Night again. And this is the first time that I've come since the before times. But as many of the familiar faces know, like I was a regular, um, oftentimes people think that we started at Shy Hack Night, but we just kind of were in the back. And this is actually from the before times. This is the last time I presented at Shy Hack Night. A lot of familiar faces, some same faces in the same room tonight. Who in this room was actually there? Raise of hands. Yeah. Uh huh. Maybe I. Th I assume so. <laughs> you biked there. Okay. All right. So show of hands. How many people have heard of Bike Lane Uprising before tonight? Okay. How many people bike? Okay. How many people do not bike, but have heard of Bike Lane Uprising? All right, we got a couple. <laughs> All right. As mentioned, I'm Christina Whitehouse. I'm the founder of Bike Lane Uprising. Uh, for the folks that have been following the Bike Lane Uprising story and, you know, our work on social media and whatnot, uh, we have had a lot of media attention. We've been, you know, featured in local and national and some international news. I was recently uh, named as one of the top 50 people in American cycling. Uh, coincidentally, I am actually not even really athletic, so don't conflate the two. <laughs> I was also named a Chicagoan of the year. Pretty, pretty strange. <laughs> and the, the question that I always get, no, it's not my bike. Uh, it is my friend's bike. He built it and my other friend owns it and we thought it would be good product placement. <laughs> And it's green. All right, so the title of this presentation is how I accidentally started an uprising because I, in 2017, when Bike Lane Uprising started, I was the least likely person in the room to make Bike Lane Uprising. I didn't own a bicycle. Uh, I was probably a two to three solid years into Bike Lane Uprising and still didn't own a bicycle, and I was pretty vocal about it. Uh, I wasn't a part of the biking community. Like, I mean, some of my friends rode bikes. That's kind of the closest thing that I came to being a part of the bike community. I wasn't a developer, not a marketer. I didn't really use social media. I was not political, and I had no idea what an older person was. And it's really interesting to think of 2017 me compared to, you know, 2024 me. Most people may have heard the story about, you know, how this, the precipice of Bike Lane Uprising, but this is the truck that nearly ran me over almost like eight years to the day. Um, I was actually biking to Neocon at the Merchandise Mart. Neocon is actually going on right now. There's actually some Neocon things in the room, yeah. Uh, and I was on the, I was on a Divi bike, I was going to Neocon and this truck driver almost ran me over. Uh, he went into the bike lane so sharply, he went to turn, roll through a red light that um, he was actually going onto the sidewalk to my right. I was trying to push myself off of the side of the truck to prevent myself from going going under the back wheels. And for anyone in the room that's ridden a divvy, you know that those things don't turn fast. Uh, and I just remember thinking that there, you know, I was, maybe he didn't see me and I wanted him to see me. So I chased after him for a couple of blocks. I caught up with him right before he went under lower whacker and I got him to roll down his window. I said, do you realize that you almost ran me over? He stone faced looked me in the eyes and said, yes and he took off again. I tried getting a hold of his company, I tried get, doing all sorts of things, nobody cared. Um, nobody responded, and I just remember, you know, coming from like this design background of like really realizing how hard it was, but also how simple it could be to actually make something. And then two weeks later, the first share bike rider in the United States was killed in Chicago, uh, Ginny Murray. Uh, I have had dinner with Ginny's mother, and um, it's... I could have been her. It was really similar circumstance, Divi bike, uh, about the same age, very similar circumstance. So it just kind of stuck with me. 
I was graduating. I was not used to only working 40 hours a week, and I was looking for something to do with those other 40 hours of my week. And I was at game night one night, and I asked my friends what they thought about this idea for documenting bike lane obstructions. And they th said that, you know, they thought it was a good idea. And I started researching, asking bicyclists around Chicago just kind of their experience about biking. And I kept on hearing the same exact quote over and over. I feel like nobody cares. I feel like nobody cares. There was no way to report bike lane obstructions. There was no recourse if you were almost killed. There was nothing. And I, you know, it's like, it's so simple. Just like make something, right? Uh, for the folks in this room, very knowledgeable about the issues faced by the biking community, but for folks that are not bicyclists, the reality is, is only a teeny tiny portion of the streets have any designation for bicyclists at all. And the, the designations that are out there, typically it's bike lanes that are just not safe, share rows, painted only, those painted faded bike lanes that you can't even tell are bike lanes anymore. And the bike lanes that do exist are often being used as extra parking spaces, extra driving lanes, distribution centers, and they're just not really being maintained at all. They're not being cleaned. They're not being, you know, plowed during the winter. And through the course of all of this, bicyclist deaths and injuries have just been skyrocketing, and we've seen that firsthand. So came Bike Lane Uprising. Um, it was this little tiny passion project that I used to hide on the internet. I actively tried to hide it on the internet. And it ended up all over the news. And it ended up all over the news before my friends even knew I was doing it. Dexter, did you know that I was doing it when it ended up? No, exactly. I was getting text messages that was like, wait, what is this? Why are, are you on my TV right now? Um, and I didn't really know what it was going to be. And it was, again, there was no real strategy behind it. It was just like I had a you know design background and makers got to make. So I just started noodling with something. So we have a mobile app. Uh, it was actually built during the pandemic. Uh, we continue to build it, uh, but bicyclists are able to download the mobile app. They are able to take photos of people parked in bike lanes or unsafe lane conditions. They are able to upload those photos to the mobile app. The mobile app extracts data from photos to help fill out the form. All of those bike lane obstructions go to our live database feed. You can actually see them come in in real time. And then they all get mapped. And what we've seen is, you know, Cisco is parking in the bike lanes here. FedEx is parking in the bike lanes here, but they're doing it everywhere. It's not just here. So we're able to take all of that data and aggregate it together. And my little passion project that I tried hiding on the internet is no longer hidden on the internet. Um, it spread via word of mouth. This is a screenshot from, I don't know, probably earlier this week, but this is a screenshot of our maps. And this is where everyone has reported a bike lane obstruction that had a geolocation included. And you can search it, sort it, filter it, but you can see that it's it's spread. And the more it spreads outside of Chicago, there is a very large following in Chicago, as you can clearly see in the room, but it's spreading. And the more it spreads, the more we're able to do some really interesting things with that data because it allows us to look at things on more of a national level because a lot of these companies are on a national level. Our data is incredibly detailed and logged and tagged and categorized and our data can be sorted and filtered and cross sorted and there's some really interesting things that we can do with it and we started out you know small but we can look at you know data about the actual bike lanes so we can look at just stats about what are the different types of bike lanes that people are reporting as well as the obstruction types and kind of compare it to different cities and different companies um, so far we have collected over 70,000 bike lane obstructions with our database. And in the beginning, I was told that no one would submit bike lane obstructions to it. <laughs> so uh, kind of an interesting look back. And in the beginning, when it was a passion project, it wasn't supposed to actually work. And it ended up all over the news, but it was working enough that people were actually using just my little proof of concept, you know, to actually use it. And it was super painful to use. I, to this day, cannot believe anyone used it during that time, but they did. And we're continuing to just kind of add to it, add to it, add to it. But those 70,000 bike lane obstructions, that's easily $10 million in unrealized fines, just to put it into trajectory of numbers. Um, 
that's probably on the low side. That's probably the lowest it could be because if you look at the different types of obstructions or how, you know, just what city it's in or where it's located within cities, it could be easily three times that amount. Um, like construction zones, if it's a construction zone, oftentimes it could be in the thousands or like snow plowed, it could be like 600 and you have to go to court. Um, in Chicago alone, there have been over 46,000 bike lane obstructions reported. Um, anybody in here report a bike lane obstruction? All right. <laughs> uh, with the amount of bike lane obstructions that have been submitted to date, that's easily $7 million. And again, that $7 million in unrealized fines could have been probably three times as much. For the people that are not familiar with what a bike lane obstruction is, this is a bike lane obstruction. And if you actually look closely, it says what to expect when you're expecting a teenager. <laughs> and that, that's my favorite part of the whole thing. This is a bike lane obstruction. Uh, this is a bike lane obstruction. This is also a bike lane obstruction. This is actually CDOT the Chicago Department of Transportation blocking the bike lane when they had more than enough space to park somewhere else. And I believe this was during rush hour and look how much they care. So things that I've learned from all of this, because again, I came into this not knowing a thing. Um, I have learned that there is absolutely no silver bullet that's gonna solve this whole thing. Uh, it's a really complicated issue and it's gonna need a lot of different things to help chip away at the problem. But what I do know is the more you understand the problem of blocked bike lanes, the more you can come up with those unique solutions. So you can kind of go after different types of bike lane obstructions and, you know, try to chip away at like each type of bike lane obstruction and make it like, you know, maybe 5% better, 10% better, you know, with all of these different solutions. And that all adds up. We have interacted with a lot of different entities over the years. Again, I came as a complete outsider. So the fact that we are, you know, familiar and in interacting with these entities is pretty crazy. We have worked with the companies that are actually blocking the bike lanes. A lot of companies um, appreciate the, you know, the detailed photos and, you know, all of the detailed reports that you put in because they actually need it to reach out to their employees. Um, there are some companies that actually tie it to their um, employee bonuses for the year, so safe driving. Uh, we've worked with a lot of city agencies, state agencies, uh, biking groups. I mean, a lot of families that have had um, a loved one killed and you name it. Going into this, complete outsider, uh, but our platform became this hub to really become a gateway for community engagement. So while yes, it's a database for documenting bike lane obstructions, it was also a way for people to just kind of find one another. A lot of the times when we're all biking, we're biking by ourselves and you are kind of faced with your own problems, but I'm also facing the same problem that you're facing. And so he, you know, so it allowed a lot of us that wanted to actually do something about it and not just complain, to actually get together and try to make things better. When we, when I was here the last time, um, I, my goal was to, you know, end ghost bikes. And the, you know, the statement was that, you know, that there wouldn't be any more, but now I have taken on doing ghost bikes and vigils. Um, show of hands, was anybody at Ade's ghost bike vigil from this photo? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you for everyone that comes out to those. The families really, really appreciate it. It's not a fun time and um, it really means a lot to folks, even the folks that like aren't able to make it in person, that you know, a lot of folks travel in, a lot of folks miss the you know, funerals. So the ghost bike vigils are kind of like their second attempt at, you know, getting a funeral. Our followers have funded over 5,000 sets of bike lights to date. It started out, we were hoping to get 100 sponsored. And during the pandemic, we just noticed a lot of people biking and that didn't have lights. And we were like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could just like buy some and give them out? And it just continues to grow. Um, and we've given out lights all around the United States. And um, I'm excited to see how many more it's gonna be. Has anybody in here been stopped and been given bike lights out on the street? No? Has anyone given out bike lights in this room? All right, we got some people, yep. Yeah. Our data, there's a lot of opportunities for the data. Our, da our data identifies where to focus infrastructure improvements and our hotspots have been actually, you know, 
seen some love over the years, um, definitely needs more, but uh, it's also an opportunity for targeted enforcement. Uh, our data has led to laws and policy enhancements. We identified a loophole in some laws in Chicago and worked to get that law changed, and it was. Uh, our data led to an Office of the Inspector General investigation. Uh, that report is possibly coming out soon. Our data uncovered critical flaws with the 311 system, and the 311 system had been completely broken for well over a year, cost taxpayers $35 million, and nobody knew it was broken. Our data shows who blocks bike lanes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for folks that can't see this well enough, this is Lori Lightfoot. She was documented um, parking in a bike lane after she went grandstanding, uh, after there was just a tirade of children getting killed riding bikes that summer. And she turned a blind eye to all of the bicyclists getting killed in Chicago and um, uh, parked in the bike lane to get donuts. And uh, we received reports of it. Uh, we shared it on social media. It ended up on every single newspaper in Chicago and uh, was compared to the haircut gate. Our data also identifies repeat bike lane obstructors. So everything is logged, tagged, and linked together in a way that it's searchable, sortable, filterable. Um, Angela Park was a mother of two. She was a triathlete. She was killed in the West Loop. And when it hit the news, I immediately recognized the company of the truck that was involved in the crash. And I knew them because they had been submitted to our database 17 times that same year. So there's a signal between folks that are parking in bike lanes and how they just kind of drive out on the streets and their disregard to safety protocols. And our data has been used in court cases where bicyclists have been killed or injured. Um, we all know the story about Lily Shambrook, the three-year-old that was killed in Chicago. Uh, her family was biking on the Greenway. Uh, there was a ComEd truck blocking the bike lane, uh, and the family went around them into traffic, and they were the, the daughter was killed um, by a semi on a Greenway. And from those photos, I immediately recognized that Ahmed was involved. And from that, we immediately searched the database and found that there had been over, you know, 60 bike lane obstructions involving Comed. And a few years prior, I had actually tweeted to them, letting them know that there was a problem. Then their drivers were incredibly just rude about it. Uh, and they actually acknowledged receiving it. And I told them that it wasn't just an isolated incident, that this was a cultural shift and nothing happened and a three-year-old lost their life. Uh, I learned about the biking ecosystem just as a whole. And in order to actually get anyone to pay attention to bicyclists, you have to do all of these things. And it's fragmented and it's an astronomical amount of work to make biking safer. You have to identify the problem, illustrate the size and political weight of your movement in order to get anyone to pay attention. And if you are able to do that, you can get the news to pay attention to you. If you get the news to pay attention to you, then you can get the general population to pay attention to you. That starts putting pressure on the political leaders. Then that political leader, you know, groups that actually care about what you're saying will actually start forcing the city departments to do something about it or give them leeway to do the things that they wanted to do already. But the city departments, like a department of transportation, is unfortunately a political department and it's going to be subject to whoever's mayor at the time. And that's a four year cycle that just isn't enough time to get road infrastructure built in time. But if they are able to get something done, then safer bike conditions are built, uh, the bike community grows, momentum is created and you can move on to the next thing and make it a little bit better and a little bit better. Um, but unfortunately, there's just a lot that just doesn't work in that. That is an astronomical amount of work, and it's fragmented, and it means that the way that things are done in Chicago is not the way that things are done in Boston or Florida or you name it. And you have to take a look at the social the set factors, the social, technological, and the economic factors. And what I've learned is that biking is on the rise. We all agree on that, right? We know that bike lane enforcement is 
politically contentious. Uh, we know that when a cyclist is killed or injured, that the chance of getting tickets is slim to none. We know that there's little to no training for drivers. We know that um, insurance costs for fleets are rising. We know insurance companies are actually pulling out of markets because the insurance is so bad on some of these companies. And we know that all of these cities just have their own little way of doing things. So, We've been working on this thing called Uprise, and it's a way to aggregate data, specifically transportation data. This has been like a back burner thing that we've been just kind of like doing, doing, doing in the background. I found that it was hard to identify companies a lot of the times, but that there was other data that you could kind of stitch together and identify it. And we had built some tools just for ourselves to tag bike lane obstructions, and we just keep on building it, building it, building it. Uh, so the idea is, Bicyclists, many of you in the room, you submit data to Bike Lane Uprising. We take other data that's publicly available, massive, massive data sets. We link that together and aggregate it in this thing called Uprise. And from that, we have these kind of unique use cases, uh, reports, analysis, you know, portal search, um, data image searches. Uh, we can build some really interesting training guides because we have all of these photos and we can search different bike lane types and just also like helping some of these companies. Um, so users, we think users of this thing called Uprise it, are companies themselves. So instead of relying on cities to do some of this, we've already had a history of reaching out to companies and just starting to chip away at it. So we think that we can amp that up. And, you know, insurance companies, lawyers, news reporters, you name it. And from that, the way that we are for bicyclists and all of the things that we are do are very for the bike community, we're going to do that same thing for companies in a way that's forward thinking, you know, welcoming, trying to go towards the actual solution of it. So helping them really improve the safety of their fleets. And we have an just bajillions of data points. Um, we, within this data set that we have, we have about 3 million company profiles, and that's why we're focused on going more of a national level with Bike Lane Uprising, because we can pair it with this national level data. Um, we have 74 million inspection reports of companies that have USCOT numbers. We have 174 million violations within this data set and 4 million crashes and just more data within that that you can, like, yeah, it's insane. And again, the goal is that by, you know, these two unique forward-facing brands, they both have services that really provide this symbiotic relationship to one another. So the way that we communicate with the companies helps solve some of the issues that are taking place within the biking community because we can go to the root of the problem. A lot of the companies that are doing it, when I showed you the maps, 25% of the you know folks that are reported in bike lanes are companies. And there's a lot of other opportunities from like the infrastructure standpoint. So the idea is, is like, what if we could help the companies reduce their insurance costs and improve their safety at the same time? That's kind of the pitch, right? Uh, what if drivers were actually trained about bike lanes and bicyclist safety? Because as of right now, bike lanes, the design of bike lanes is inconsistent within a city and it's inconsistent in different cities and different states. If you, like, I'm... I would consider myself a subject matter expert when it comes to bike lanes. And when I am biking sometimes, I can't tell where the bike lane just went um, or what it is because it's just, people are just trying to retrofit things that already existed. And if I don't know, somebody in a semi who doesn't bike or hasn't biked since they were like four also probably can't tell. What if we could get more companies to tie their employees' annual bonuses to safe driving records? Uh, this is a new trend that's taking off. A lot of the companies feel that they're going to pay somebody one way or the other, and they'd prefer to pay their employees that money versus insurance companies. And then what if we could just provide a transparent feedback loop regarding driver habits and company safety risks? Right now, a lot of them don't even totally know what's happening.
And what if companies had metrics they could leverage regarding their safe driving to win contracts? So with that being said, what if we help them actually use safety as a differentiator instead of being just fast? So what if they are setting themselves apart from the competition based on safety? And if they can see what their safe driving is, then they can also see how they compare to their competitors, which means what if other companies are nudging companies to be safer instead of just the bike? community. Um, so again, like maybe it's like annual quarterly reports, driver's training courses, data portal access. With that being said, if you like any of that and you like what we do, you can support our work um, and just keep it going, right? So we got to keep that data coming in, get it more on a national level, spread it out. Uh, you can submit bike lane obstructions. You can shop our online store. You can financially support our work. You can become a volunteer. Show hands of the volunteers, post, present, future volunteers. All right. Yeah. Uh, and you can just help spread the word. So everybody had like a little card on their chair. Give it away to somebody. And I just got to say, I have a very soft spot in my heart uh, for Shy Hack Night. The absolutely just most amazing people pass through this room. The smartest, most caring people in the bike community. One of our volunteers actually got married to another Shy Hack Night uh, volunteer. This was their wedding. <laughs> um, and I mean, you have done awesome stuff and I'm always thrilled to just see what comes in, in and out of here, like the most influential things in Chicago. Go look at their Treasure Trove of videos. Just wonderful, wonderful things. If folks have ever seen the, uh, the reflective jacket that we have, we actually... Uh, uh, fit it on a lot of people at Shy Hack Night. And uh, the dancer on the left is actually somebody that used to pass through Shy Hack Night pretty regularly. Um, all right, so with that, questions? I really appreciate your uh, practical ethos about fixing the problem and that you're trying to find a way to kind of use the market to change behavior. Um, but I want to ask about politics instead. Uh, sure. <laughs> which is, uh, in my time away from Chicago, I've become a lot more cynical and political. And it seems like the flywheel you were describing, that's just political organizing, right? That's what, that's what that is. You organize constituency, you pressure politicians, and you... So uh, can you explain what are the obstacles to having cops enforce the law? Because it's, it's illegal, right? They shouldn't be. Okay, but, but, but what are they? There's so many more opportunities to enforce bike lanes than cops. Like, it's honestly, it, the whole thing can be automated. Like, it's not something where a police officer actually has to get involved. And honestly, enforcement isn't going to solve bike lane obstructions in total. Like, there's going to be people that just will go around that, right? Um, but also, bike lanes and bike infrastructure shouldn't be political. Like, whether or not you made it here tonight on your bike shouldn't have been political. Like, it should have just been a known thing that you would have gotten here safely. And I shouldn't have to reorganize and restructure every four years to meet and introduce myself and try to sway a politician to care about your safety. You know? How I feel. So you weren't a developer, uh, right? But you... <clears throat> You were coming by here, and I'm curious about your journey uh, to launching your app uh, in the pandemic. How, uh, What resources did you tap into, and, and how did you get that built? So I started it just on a website, and I used a lot of low-code, no-code stuff, and then people came around, and I think once it just ended up going viral immediately, like, I mean, I... I started researching the problem of bike lane obstructions and within a couple of months it was like viral in Chicago. Um, it was really uncomfortable. I'm also an introvert and I don't really, that was not a comfortable space for me. And um, I just, I did, I just saw, found some things on the internet and stitched them together of like, oh, you could do this and this and this. And then it kind of blew up and it was a really painful process. Technology changed and shifts and all of that and things don't always work together. And then really smart, passionate people came along and said, I want to help out with what you're doing. I think it's cool and I can do a better job than you did. <laughs> and uh, they did <laughs> and they can. Um, and honestly, presenting here at Shy Hack Night, a lot of people watch that video and like some of our 
most wonderful volunteers came from that video because whether they were there or not, somebody they know went and they sent them the link. They're like, oh, you like bikes? Watch this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I saw you mentioned with your map, like there's like you can see like patterns of bike lane obstructions. But I think even listening to like city council meetings, sometimes I feel like there's aldermen who are like, yeah, well, people in my ward don't bike, so I'm not going to do anything. How, what in your data or, or what tools can you leverage to show people where new bike lanes might be needed? I think folks want bike lanes everywhere, right? Um, and the bike lanes that we have are just really disjointed and they don't make sense and all sorts of things. And a lot of the older people that stated that people don't bike in their wards, well, I mean, we had a lot of cyclists get killed in their wards. So clearly that was untrue. But some people just don't care. And um, our focus was working on identifying how people were voting. So during the last election, we did a pretty extensive voter guide. Did anybody see our voter guide? Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of time on that. We went through menu money funding, seeing kind of where, you know, different alders were spending their money, um, how they were voting, and really just allowing their track record to show for themselves. And we were able to, you know, get them maybe not reelected. <laughs> um, just curious about how you make sure that... Um you know, there's a lot of bike lanes downtown. What if everyone is then also reporting obstructions in those downtown areas? How do you make sure that the app doesn't sort of... Biased? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the million-dollar question. Every map of Chicago looks like a map of Chicago, right? Like, it looks like the same map of Chicago, except for ours. Ours actually looks different. And if you look at our heat maps and if you zoom into Chicago, you'll see that it's spread out. And a lot of that came from just all of the advocacy work and just, like, getting to know one another. Um, so much of Chicago biking and just Chicago in general, right? Like, it's just a really disjointed, segregated city. And we put a lot of effort into just amping up the folks that were already doing work in their communities. So instead of us, you know, planning our own ride, we amped up the other rides that were already being done in the community. Instead of us putting on our own things, we just, you know, we just tried to like kind of lift everybody else up. And I think from that, it goes to show, like it's, you see it in all of our events in person, you see it in the data, you can see it in the names that come through, you can see it on social media. We have a really incredibly diverse following and I'm really proud of that. And it's in any type of diversity that you could possibly think of. And it's the thing that we always get called out for whenever we have an event somewhere, they're like, and it, especially when you see everybody's bikes, you're like, there's like every type of bike rider here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we all give her one more last minute of applause? Woo!